Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Conrad with AIM Transportation Solutions. And first off, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, you're all here because, like it or not, the winter months are upon us, which of course means snow, ice, and freezing temperatures. And I think it goes without saying that those uh, that those things pose major problems and real dangers for professional truck drivers. And whether you're new to operating in the winter or you're a seasoned vet, there's a lot to remember in and outside of the truck to ensure the safety of the driver, those they encounter on the road, and of course, the cargo they're hauling. So for some of you, what our resident expert and AIM safety manager, John Rugarber, covers today will be some great new information you can put into action immediately. And for the rest of you, it's going to be a valuable, valuable review given just how much goes into operating a truck safely in harsh winter conditions. So now before I hand the mic over to John, I just want to give a quick high level overview of what we do at AIM. And we are a complete transportation solutions provider, which includes full service truck leasing, commercial truck rentals, dedicated contract carriage, maintenance programs, including professional shop management, uh, used truck sales and freight brokerage. As it pertains to um, as it pertains to our topic today, many of these services can be your first line of defense against the punishing winter months. Our full service lease and maintenance customers, for example, operate with confidence knowing their trucks are mechanically fit from top to bottom for the cold months ahead and beyond. Then of course, there's our AIM Integrated Logistics Division, which is a top 25 transport topics uh, logistics company that will take all the worry, all the headaches and all the obligations off your plate by providing you trucks, drivers, 24 seven support. Uh, and that's really just the tip of the iceberg of what those guys do over there. But at the end of the day, whether you're an AIM customer or not, we we feel that we're all in this together and we want you to have a safe and successful operation. That's why we're happy to be a resource for you. And one way we do that is by making our experts like Mr. John Rue Garber here uh, available through channels like these monthly webinars. So uh, so we're going to go ahead and get into it now. I just want to quickly note that we are recording this session and in the coming days you'll receive a follow up email containing resources, including a link to the recording that you're free to share with whomever. Um, that email will also have John's contact information in case you have any questions down the road. And then finally, speaking of questions, if you have any during uh, during today's session, John will go ahead and answer those following his presentation. So uh, now with all that out of the way, John, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, Conrad. I appreciate the gracious introduction there. Uh, as Conrad mentioned, my name is John Rugarber. I work for AIM Transportation Solutions. I've been with AIM for about 22, 23 years, give or take. Began my career as a driver itself, and then I moved on to safety about 12 years ago. I uh, found that very rewarding, and I really enjoy uh, presenting these webinar series that we have been putting on now for a few years, and we're going to slowly add some more as time goes on. But uh, I really do enjoy doing this, trying to share some information and, and trying to give some practical application to a lot of what's out there. Try to get out of uh, out of the office scenario into the real life world. And uh, I think I can get that ac across uh, a little better than the average guy because I, I have driven a truck. I continue to drive a truck and I do know how difficult it is out there sometimes to accomplish this. So this is, again, the safe winter driving webinar series for December. We did have one last December also. Uh, the safety director and another safety manager were actually presented that last year, and I chose to take that project on this year. Uh, my contact information is down below my name, jrugarber at aimntls.com. If anybody has any additional questions, comments, as always, I am very receptive to both of those. I, I can always continue to learn, and I'm also anxious to help people. So if you have any questions in there, feel free to put them in, and I will try to help you out. Uh, so let's move on and get started with the safety winter driving portion of this. All right, so there may be some of us, not sure how many of us, but there may be some very lucky people right now sitting in this log cabin somewhere in the mountains, enjoying the light snowfall out that window, watching the fireplace crackle away, maybe have a small drink in their hand and being able to watch a football game or something like that. And then after you're done that, you may want to move on and grab the family, grab the kids, get all dressed up, and you may want to take a little hike outside. Enjoy that time with your wife, enjoy the crisp weather and a little bit of exercise that we have going on. 
during the winter months. And then once you're completed that little escapade, you can move on to getting some really physical stuff done. You can move into some snow skiing, maybe call your buddy from college, high school, put those skis on and start jumping the slopes and working on that. Uh, I think it's what, Black Diamond is the difficult one. I don't know which end of the skis go forward. So I think the Black Diamond is the uh, serious one. And then the last one after that exhausting day of relaxation and enjoyment, now you can sit around the fireplace with the family. You could toast some marshmallows and be wrapped up in warm blankets and call it a day as you reside or you, you go to sleep in your in your own bed and enjoy life. Well, that is the marketing material for a nice place up in the mountains of Colorado during the winter. The reality of the situation is, is probably anybody that's on this call right now has something to do with transportation. And this is probably more or less what we run into in our world. We've probably all seen someone like this. If anyone notices, for those uh, eagle-eyed people out there, this is probably done taken in uh, somewhere in Europe. The steering wheels on the opposite side of the road uh, of the car. The car is actually on the opposite side of the road, so this is not a picture from America. But the feelings are the same. You could see a snow-covered roadway. You could see the anxiety in the woman's eyes through the rearview mirror. She does not look comfortable. Uh, she's got the death grip on the steering wheel. So any of us drivers are out there or any of the drivers that we take care of, we look down and we see that that view from our driver window of the truck pretty often as we look down into cars in snowy type weather. The next picture. Now, we can only hope that this gentleman is not one of our drivers. But I have seen a few people in my career that have probably had this look and that are one step away from pulling over to park the car or the truck because they're uh, deathly afraid of what's occurring in the in the adverse weather and the, the winter roadways. Um, the end result of some of these situations ends up being what we all are familiar with. And these are the accidents that occur. Probably some interstate, some rural road, ice covered, snow covered, car was traveling too fast for conditions, lost control and ended up overturning the vehicle. Uh, and then the last one, and then now this is gonna pertain to pretty much everyone here directly, is how many times we've seen these scenes on the side of the road, mostly interstates, jackknife tractor trailers. Uh, there was just recently, I think a month, month ago or so, Conrad in Ohio, a large accident involving multiple vehicles, numerous commercial motor vehicles on the Ohio Turnpike. Uh, so these are actually kind of the four pictures that I think we work with more so than the first four pictures I showed but I wanted to show the difference between what some people think we do and what we all on this webinar know what we do on a daily basis and are currently doing today. Um, on top of all these items that you're looking at on this screen, uh, we may be one of those drivers that really have been good drivers throughout our career. We never have any problems. We know how to handle the situation. We slow down when it's necessary. We have the right equipment, uh, but there's always that outside factor in there. And all of a sudden, as much as you've done, that whiteout occurs and everything that you can see now rapidly disappears. And that's pretty much all you could see is a white expanse in front of you. And you can only hope for the best. You can only hope that you've prepared yourself to take evasive action and be able to stop or avoid any incidents that may come our way. So uh, that's how quickly things can change. Any of you up in the Northeast, or up in the Northwest, the Montanas, Idaho, Dakotas, uh, Whiteouts, Colorado, they're, they're, they're very common, something that you need to be aware of as time goes on. This, this picture was taken from the DOT, the Federal Highway Administration Road Weather Management Program. There's quite a bit of good information actually on this website. I put the little source down on the right-hand side if anybody wants to just Google that in. You can find some interest, interesting information on that website. One of the things that I found interesting was that 70% uh, of America, the roadways, experience some type of snow event. And as you can see in this picture here, we have the entire upper expanse of the United States that experiences, uh, I think, annually 
uh, somewhere along the lines of at least five inches of snow throughout the course of the season. Now you get down in this red area down here, you have most of Texas, a little bit of Southern Oklahoma, Arkansas, uh, what is that, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, the Carolinas, and Florida. They really don't fall into this category so much. You may experience ice and things of that nature, but you won't experience the snow. And also that covers across into the southwestern desert of New Mexico and Arizona, and then up along the coast into California, Oregon, and Washington, where you won't be experiencing, experiencing those uh, snow issues. Okay, so under 395.2 under FMCSRs, adverse driving conditions really mean uh, snow, sleet, or fog, or other adverse weather conditions that a uh, highway covered with snow or ice or unusual road and traffic conditions none of which were apparent on the basis of information known to the person dispatching the run at the time it has begun. Uh, I know drivers, and I think we did get some questions last year about this, about the adverse driving condition. It's getting more and more difficult to apply this in your driving, in your daily driving, because of the use of technology and knowing that a storm is coming. So to say that you weren't aware that there was going to be a blizzard in Iowa, as you left Florida 30 or 40 years ago could have been very true. In today's world, you pretty much know that there's gonna be a blizzard on Thursday in Iowa. You're leaving from Florida to make a delivery. You should be aware that that storm is coming and plan accordingly, whether that be uh, either try to get in early or try to avoid that situation. So using the adverse driving conditions uh, gets to be a little difficult if drivers tend to try to use that in their daily functioning. Now, 395.1B1, uh, if needed, they could travel an additional two hours to complete that run or reach a place of safety. So if you fell into that category for whatever reason, there is a stipulation that you could use an additional two hours although still not going over your 14 hour window to try to get to a safe haven or to try to get to your delivery. So let's take a look at some, uh, some of the statistics that I found and they were found on that website also that you see in that lower right hand corner. Like I mentioned earlier, 70% of the roads are located in snowy regions, which receive more than five inches of snow annually. I actually wasn't aware of that until I began to research this a little, little deeper. I wouldn't have thought that it was quite that high, but I guess it makes complete sense the more you think about it. Another interesting uh, fact, 70% of the population live in these snowy regions. Well, that's quite a few people. As of the last reading, there were approximately 332 million people in the country. So that means roughly 232 million people of that group live within those snowy regions. So that's quite a lot of people. And I would imagine that quite a lot of truck drivers are involved in that situation also. So again, just some inter interesting statistics that I found when I was doing some research on this. Uh, each year, approximately 24% of weather-related accidents occur on snowy slush or ice-covered roadways. So we shouldn't find that too surprising necessarily that those accidents do occur in those type of conditions. Uh, but that is 24%. So roughly one out of every four vehicles will be involved in a crash involving snow, slush, or ice. Um, and actually 15% of that 24% occur during periods of time when the snow or ice and, or sleet is actively occurring. So it's not a matter of it, it snowed yesterday and you're driving on, on old snow. It's 15% of that 24% has, uh, has occurred while it's been actively snowing. Uh, fourth one down here, arterial and freeway speeds decline. Another interesting subject. So arterial or secondary roadways, they, they, Assume that speeds are decreasing approximately 30 to 40 percent on snowy roadways. In other words, on your secondary roadways. So let's just say, for example, you're traveling 40 miles an hour. So let's say, let's use an average of 35 percent 
So let's say 35% of 40 miles an hour is about 14 miles an hour. So really, snow's falling on the roadway. You're doing 40. You should normally do 40 miles an hour on a dry roadway in the middle of summer. You may want to decrease your speed down to 26 miles per hour to allow for that snowy or icy or sleek conditions on the roadway. The freeway speeds, they found that they decrease anywhere from 3 to 13%. So now you're, let's call an average of 8% there on the mean. Between 3 and 13, I chose 8% as an average. If you pull 8% off of 65 miles an hour, that's approximately 5.2 miles per hour. So that brings you down from 65 to 60, which is still quite fast, depending on the amount of snow that's on the roadway or the ice or the sleet that, that you're involved in at that particular time. So... You know, it's just something to keep in mind as much as you think you may be slowing down enough, chances are you aren't. Because most people, I think, uh, for any safety people involved or on this webinar today or involved with dealing with people, if you were to ask them if they feel that they're good drivers, I would say 99 out of 100 people will tell you they, they consider themselves good drivers. Uh, it's just human nature that we want to think that we're better than we may be at certain things. Uh, inevitably, you only find out that you're not quite as good as you thought you were when those uh, those talents are needed the most. All right, so let's talk about snow a little bit. Uh, we talked about decreasing our speed and increasing your following distance. So the average following distance on a dry roadway in the summertime for large commercial motor vehicles, Ames policy is six seconds. Other companies may have a little larger, but let's call it an average of six to eight seconds on the on following distances. Uh, as we can tell, we travel the roadways every day. Very few people can truly follow that following distance. And it's a shame because the habits we get into when the weather is perfect and the conditions are perfect are the same habits that we bring to the table when the weather gets bad. Most people do not change the way they drive dramatically when it goes from being good weather to bad weather. And that's really what ends up, we've been seeing more and more of these large multi-vehicle collisions on the interstates. Um, a 30, 40, 50 car truck vehicle pileups on the interstates. And the majority of these, I think if you were to ask the majority of the participants involved in the accident, they would tell you that they thought that they could stop if something went wrong. And obviously, many of them could not. Uh, their following distances are, were obviously much too short. They probably weren't paying attention as much as they should have. And once the chain reaction begins, it's very difficult to get around that and avoid being in that accident. So really, you, you train yourself to drive in a particular fashion when the going is good. You don't train to do things, uh, deal with emergency situations when the emergency situation is occurred. Uh, that's what training is all about. So you want to try to change that mentality. Also, the University of Lincoln, I think it's Lincoln, Nebraska, if I'm not mistaken, uh, did a study in, in, from the Vision Science Department, and they found that there's called an adaptation effect, which the fancy name they called it was velocity renormalization. In other words, it's a fancy way of saying that, oh, as much as I think that I can handle the speed that I'm going, 75 miles on the interstate, it's surprising how quickly that speed wakes you up when you go to get off at a short exit ramp. Pennsylvania, uh, I know for an example, is notorious for their short entrance ramps. So you're doing 70, 75 miles an hour cruising along. You get used to that speed. It becomes comfortable. Let's say you, are ha you do have a good falling distance and you are doing things right at that moment. But when you go to get off the exit, it catches you by surprise. And now you find yourself braking much harder than you normally would have because you just didn't realize that the exit was that short and that you were going that fast. Uh, it also 
comes into play in fog. They've done many studies on fog and, and that will be coming up. Uh, I got three slides here, snow, ice and fog. So I'll leave that little bit of information I got remaining for the fog to when we get to that slide. But really, it's just something to keep in mind that we're out there. Also, another deceiving factor on the interstate is if it's wide, it's a big open expanse of space most times. And that gives you a sense that you're not going as fast as you really are. If you were to do 70 miles an hour on a residential roadway with houses uh, close together, sidewalks right there, trees on the tree lawn, and garbage cans along the curb, you can you can tell you're going quite fast. If you you know you have no objects other than trees on a freeway with large three four lane freeways, doing 80 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, sometimes you have to look down at your speedometer to realize you're going that fast because it does not feel like you're going that fast. So we want to stress to our drivers that to really pay attention and, and keep an eye on the speedometer. Don't become relaxed and complacent and just follow traffic because of those 30 vehicles that are around you that are all doing 80 miles an hour, one of them make a mistake, make some mistake. And next thing you know, you're involved, whether or not it's your fault or not, in a 30 or 40 car pileup. So let's talk about ice. This isn't actually a bad picture. It's a quite nice picture. It's kind of desolate, but it's got some nice features in it from a photography point of view. Interestingly enough, if you look closely at the blacktop, there's a really good chance that that may be a thin piece, a thin slice of black ice on that roadway. It's almost impossible to tell when black ice is present especially when there's no other vehicles on the road. If you're doing multiple deliveries and, and you're headed to a farm, for example, or a market out in the middle of a rural area such as this, that road has not been traveled that often. Uh, heat has not melted the ice. The driver's cruising along, not paying attention, makes a slight movement in his steering wheel and ends up being jackknifed in the middle of the road and can't quite understand what occurred. And it's because a thin layer of black ice was on top of that roadway that he either didn't pay attention to or didn't notice. So one of the biggest things you could notice out of that picture is the fact that there's fields on both sides. It allows the wind to cross over top of that asphalt unimpeded. There's no hedges, there's no buildings. So that would bring down the temperature of the roadway, in essence, bringing it down to a freezing 32 degrees causing whatever moisture is on that roadway to melt. And in turn, there you go, you have black ice. So some of the ways you can try to get ahead of the, no pun intended, curve on that is to look at your mirrors, look on the outside of your mirrors. If there's ice building up on the outside of your mirrors, that could be a good indication that there's gonna be ice on the roadway. Uh, audible, you wanna listen for certain noises. We all from, are familiar with noises, our, our turbo. Uh, is, is the turbo sound proper? Is, does the exhaust sound okay? Um, do I hear a rumbling sound? Do I hear a metallic grind? You know, we're listening for sounds all the time. All of a sudden, the sound of the tires disappears. We don't necessarily realize it immediately, but all of a sudden we think to ourselves, hmm, I, haven't, I don't hear my tires on the roadway anymore. And probably in this scenario, a good reason for that would be the fact that you're on black ice. And that would be another really good apparent warning sign. A uh, third item could be looking in your mirror at your tires. But take a look at your drive tires, if you could see them, or your trailer tires for sure. Is there spray coming off of those tires? If there is, then dry ice or dry ice, black ice is probably not present. If there's no spray coming off of your tires, that could be another real indicator that dry, uh, uh, I'll keep wanting to say dry ice, I don't know why that black ice is forming on the roadway. And again, black ice forms at approximately 32 degrees, give or take. So another uh, really important thing to keep in mind is overpasses. That transition from asphalt to concrete and then the open area underneath the overpass allows wind to travel through and bring down the temperature dramatically. There is no ground temperature at that point. You're working strictly with air temperature. 
So as you're coming up on overpasses on an interstate, you're doing 70 miles an hour, 75 miles an hour. Everything is going pretty good. And you decide you want to change lanes just as you're entering the overpass area where you're transitioning from asphalt to concrete. And next thing you know, you're on the side of the road, jackknifed, and you can't quite figure out what occurred. It's because you were making a movement and you hit that black ice and you lost traction on the drive tires and hence bringing the trailer around and now you're involved in an accident. Uh, so try to minimize or eliminate changing lanes, especially at high speeds going over top of overpasses during these type of weather events. Uh, if you feel your, your trailer breaking away by chance, uh, immediately take your foot off the accelerator. Do not touch the brake. As much as you may want to, it's very counterintuitive. But the minute you hit that brake, pretty much all bets are going to be off. I, I don't know. If I have a engineering person on this call, I would really like them to respond. I'm asking them a question. I've heard rumor that if you get between 5 to 10% or 5 to 10 degrees off of a straight line in regards to a tractor and a trailer, that the jackknifing will begin and it's almost impossible to recover from that scenario. Um, I have talked to a number of drivers, our drivers, some of them, that have recounted their jackknife situation. The common refrain I hear from them is that they never realized the trailer was coming around until they were looking at the side of their trailer in their window. They had no indication. It's just such a smooth movement that they, by the time they realized it, it was too late and they just held on. And, and luckily, no one was injured seriously, uh, but the trucks were damaged. We had considerable damage on the vehicle. So. Uh, again, I'm not sure if there if if that degree assumption is right that I said that five to ten degrees. But if you think about it, five to ten degrees off of a straight line is really not that much at all. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's something along those lines. And then also you want to try to keep open areas around you before I move on to the fog. Try to in those scenarios, try to keep an eye out for open areas. Don't be driving next to vehicles. You may be the best driver in the world. The guy next to you might not might be the worst driver in the world. So now you're really uh, involved in an accident because of what he did. Not necessarily what you did. You just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. So try to keep yourself. If you find yourself in packs of traffic in this inclement weather, uh, try to open up the spaces. You know, don't don't be driving next to someone right next to you for an extended period of time. If you're passing somebody, try to pass them in a reasonably quickly amount, quick amount of time. We don't need the speed to get around them, but we don't want to hang out there forever. Just bad things can happen. So let's move on to fog. Uh, the most time, common times for fog to form are usually in the fall and the winter, and that's because of the disparity between the temperatures of the cold and the warm. That's really part of what causes fog and when fog forms. Uh, is when the temperature differential is, is relatively large. Another way when cool air mixes with moist warm air is really one of the precursors for the formation of fog on the roadway. The moist air will cool and then it'll cause fog. So there was, uh, I think six, eight months ago, a large accident, I-55 in Alabama, if I'm not mistaken. Again, the Natura, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, those areas with the swamps and the lower lying water type of bayous, they're known for their uh, fog coming across the roadway. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, there's a couple chemical factories that actually contribute to some fog situations there. So if we have any accounts or any people on this uh, call that are from that, you know, southeastern or what is that would be that southern area, I guess, that Gulf southern area. Uh, you may even be aware of it more so than I'm mentioning it, that those areas are are tremendously dangerous when those temperature differentials come into play in the formation of fog on the roadway. Uh, now, fog usually doesn't drop out of the sky and uh, like a whiteout necessarily. You do hear people say that they drove right into it. Uh, I don't know. It, it, I, I've never, I personally have never been involved in it. I know 
that probably could happen. I'd like to think that you would see a little bit of a heads up somehow, uh, maybe people slowing down, but you know, just keep your keep your eye out for that. They also uh, Federal Highway Safety Administration also did a report and they found that those dynamic signs, those signs on the side of the road that were telling you slow down because of fog on the roadway, well, they found that those signs had no influence from their report on driver speed in regards to slowing down, which you may say, well, that why would that would be silly? This sign is telling me that fog is present up in front. Why wouldn't I slow down? And they didn't come up with a reason for it, but they did find that uh, when the sign would say, for example, slow to 30 miles an hour because of fog up ahead, that the average speed on the interstate was 61 miles an hour, even though the sign recommended to drop to 30 miles per hour. So again, is it overconfidence by the drivers, uh, security sitting within their car, uh, feeling as though even if they were involved in an accident, they would they would be protected? They don't know. The report didn't go into depth about why. But again, it's just a little interesting tidbit that really people were continuing to do 30 miles an hour over the recommended speed limit. But then those same people, if you ask them, they would probably be surprised if they got involved in an accident. So, uh, and also remember to use your low beams. Do not use your high beams when you're driving in fog. Some people think they'll be able to see better when they put their high beams on, and it really just reflects off of that fog bank back into your face. Uh, keeping your low beams on will keep the, the headlights directed down at the roadway. So try to keep that in mind as you as you travel in the fog area. Um, let's talk about checking your truck as you drive down the road. So left-hand corner, we have a tanker here. Not sure where this is. Could be anywhere in the United States. Flat piece of land, maybe a slight upgrade there. Uh, if anybody, I, I guess I should maybe put a poll on the next uh, video and I should have people do an active poll right now. How many people think this truck was moving or parked? Be an interesting, uh, to see what some of the responses were. I can't tell if this truck was moving or parked. Uh, if he was half on, half off the roadway, might be an indication. For all intents and purposes, he could have his flashers on and broke down in the middle of the road and we would never know. Uh, had he taken a break when that weather cleared, I don't, I'm not necessarily ask him, asking him to get out in a blizzard, but it would have been nice if he had gotten out at some point in time to clear off his uh, the lights on the back of his truck and just make it a bit more visible. Um, one of the ways he could have done that, if you have placards, not sure, is this tanker carrying milk or is it carrying diesel or gas? Again, I don't know. I don't know if it's even placarded. I don't see any placards because the entire rear of the vehicle is covered in ice and snow. Uh, LED trailer lights, greatest invention in the world. They don't really burn out that often and even when they do they don't usually burn out in one fell swoop they lose a couple of diodes and that gives you some time to replace it uh, but again we don't know if these lights are working or not leds don't generate much heat if at all so the previous incandescent bulbs that would generate heat and melt the snow as you went down the road well now there's no heat being generated so that snow and ice is not melting off the lenses so you know, make it a point to tell your drivers that when they come out of these areas of snow and ice and sleet to pull over somewhere, take a look at the rear of your vehicle and take a look at the front because inevitably snow is built up on the headlights also. Um, and then the last one will be the uh, wipe off the reflective tape. And just to throw in a little bit of the FMCSR regulations, so 393.13 requires that you do have retro reflective sheeting, or in other words, known as DOT tape. Um, for those of you who don't know, it needs to go along the sides and the back of the vehicle. Uh, it needs to cover, if the, for example, the trailer is 48 feet, you need to cover at least 24 feet of that trailer with the pieces spaced evenly all the way back. Same thing with the back. You can run a consistent piece all the way from edge to edge, uh, but if you wanted to save money, DOT tape is not uh, cheap for sure. 
Uh, you could split that in half, let's say an eight foot wide trailer, cut that into four feet, make sure you have uh, even spaces between the sections and go ahead and apply that. So we can see down here at the bottom, you can see slight bits of his DOT tape right there on, on the bottom, but it really isn't fully cleared out. And really, it isn't doesn't take anything more than wiping your hand over the tape to clear off the bulk of that. Any little bit would help in that type of scenario. So just some, something to keep in the back of your mind to let your drivers know. A lot of drivers, I don't think, are even aware that you can be ticketed for those violations. Um, also under 392.9B, inspection of cargo, cargo, cargo securement devices and systems, you could also be cited uh, for you need to perform an initial pre-trip, which everybody's aware of that. But within the first 50 miles, you need to stop and inspect your vehicle again and make sure that everything is okay for the securement. But also you want to stop every 50 miles or every, uh, or I'm sorry, every change of duty status in addition to driving three hours or 150 miles, whichever comes first. So those right there are reasons enough to get out of your vehicle, take a little walk around the truck, stretch your legs if you need to go to the bathroom, but don't just jump back in the cab and take off. Walk around the truck, clean up the back of the truck, the sides, and then get in your get in your truck and continue on your way. All right. So let's get we got some following distance and stopping distance information. So normal following distance I'd mentioned earlier, let's say anywhere from six to eight seconds. We at AIM recommend six seconds on a, a nice dry roadway. Some companies may request a little bit more, uh, but six seconds seems to be the general consensus in the industry. So let's say, for example, that it looks something similar to that green arrow there as a normal dry road. Well, now let's talk about the stopping distance that's needed if you're in these three different scenarios. So now you're in a rainstorm. So you need approximately 50% more stopping distance than you would on a dry roadway. And now that arrow, while not the end of the world, is growing a little bit longer than the original green arrow, as can be seen up at the top. Let's move on to snow. So snow is asking for two times the normal stopping distance. Now that the now the arrow is getting a little bit longer. We need a little bit more time. And then ice, the last one down the bottom, is asking for three times the normal stopping distance. So it's a nice graphic to look at the normal, which is the small green portion up at the top. And then you go all the way down to the bottom where ice, and you can see how much longer that uh, red arrow is. Now this is not the scale, so don't get carried away with the actual scale of this, but I think the representation could be understood just by looking at those colors and, and getting a feel for how much more distance you need uh, from a normal dry roadway and then moving on to ice. Now, there are some recommendations from some companies that if ice is that bad, that you were to pull over. And that is, uh, if the weather is that bad, we recommend that also to our drivers, to not risk your life or the, or the freight to try to get it delivered if the situation is that bad. The problem is, is you're in the situation at that moment and you may wanna stop, but you can't. Uh, you're looking for a place to stop. So in the interim, you're going to be running into these scenarios where you're going to be you know, driving on ice and snow. Ideally, if you could find patches of snow in amongst the ice covered roadway and you need to stop and you're having difficulty, is try to aim for those snowy areas. Maybe slide to the right a little bit and grab the shoulder, which is where snow can be built up. It would give you some more gripping power and some more traction to help assist in your stopping. But again, if you're using the, you know, I lead time 12 to 15 seconds ahead at interstate state speeds, you should be already be aware that these things are going to occur and start planning ahead and really not have to try to, you know, grab snow off the side of the road to come to a, a safe stop. So. So. Keep an eye on that little, little yellow vehicle that went flying across the bottom there. So what would everyone think is the number one reason for winter-related accidents? And I'd like to think that everybody on this webinar is writing 
a certain answer down right now. And I'm sure 99.9% .9 of them are going to get the right thing because the answer is driving too fast for conditions. Inevitably, they just, people are driving as though they're driving on a nice, sunny, warm day on a dry roadway, and they're not. And they end up hitting the brakes and they can't stop. And now they're involved in an accident. So that is the number one reason for winter related accidents is driving too fast for conditions. Now, there are some secondary reasons. Why don't we take a look at a couple of those? So some secondary contributing factors. Now, there's more than three. There's going to be three here. There's more than three. I could probably run out of slides if I tried to put everyone down, but we could talk about these most common. So the first one's going to be failure to keep a safe following distance. Again, it's, it's kind of, I've lost track how many times I mentioned it. You can't, you, you can't go wrong keeping a safe following distance. Um, you may get pushback from some drivers that feel that the more space they open up, the more people jump in front of them. Um, I, I, I don't have a rebuttal to that argument other than the fact is that when you get involved in an accident because you were failing to keep a safe following distance, it's going to be on your, your, your record. It's basically a rear end collision and uh, I feel sorry for you, but there's not much I can do about it. Uh, second, num second item here would be failure to adjust for low visibility. And that goes back to the slide that we mentioned with the study of uh, fog and not being able to see. It doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to slow down. They probably feel that they could see as far as they need to see to be able to stop safely. And they only find that out when the last words out of their mouth are, well, I won't say it on the webinar, but I think we probably know what they all are just as they hit the rear of the car in front of them. Um, because they thought they would be able to stop or they didn't think that car was going to be there because they thought that they could see through the fog or the heavy rain or the snow or whatever the case may be. So you really need to constantly adjust your visibility or your eyes for low visibility circum circumstances. And then the last one, loss of traction when stopping. Uh, again, it's, this, is, this is going to be another one of those things where life is great i mean you're just cruising along and you feel as though you're in a formula one car on i-80 or i-40 or i-70 or any one of the big interstates you're doing 80 miles an hour and and your next job application is going to be a formula one driver over in europe and that is true at that particular millisecond in time because nothing is occurring it's only when things begin to fall apart is when really your training and your experience and your common sense comes into play. So now you're doing 80 miles an hour and you need to brake quite aggressively. And all of a sudden it comes to that braking point where your tires let loose. And now you may have your foot to the pedal and that pedal is on the floor and that truck is not stopping because you were going too fast the tires broke traction and now you are skidding and there's not a thing you can do about it other than try to pump the brakes. Now in today's time with ABS, that has been helpful. But again, some extreme stops, you're just going to overwhelm the ABS system and it'll be just a straight skid and you really have lost complete control of what's going to, going to occur. You can only hope that you don't cause too much damage or have any or kill someone by hitting them. So a lot of people, that traction part kind of goes out of the equation. They're not necessarily thinking about that, the traction part, until they lose it. But by then, at that point, it's too late and they realize that they've dug a hole that's it's much too deep to get, up, get out of at that point. So you don't, want to, you don't want to get yourself in that hole to begin with. All right, so let's look at a little ac acronym here. And we'll go with SPACE, S-P-A-C-E. And let's assign a little definition of each letter onto this. So speed, we already just talked about it. The number one cause of winter driving accidents is driving too fast. 
Let's see what P gives us. Patience. Ah, oh, yes, patience. Oh, boy, that's in short supply in today's world, isn't it? Everybody seems to be in a rush. We all, everybody's in a rush to go nowhere. And it's funny, the people on the freeway, when you're right next to them, the ones that rush up ahead and you keep running into them, you look to your left and right and you see the same person over and over again when there's really nowhere to go. Uh, patience is a difficult thing sometimes, I understand, but it's a, I think it's a learned value. And the more that you try to try to make yourself better at it, the better you'll become. Courtesy in and of itself. Uh, geez, I will admit that there's been a number of times we, we, we begun to recently put cameras in our trucks uh, and courtesy has come to the forefront in regards to drivers being courteous to other drivers, letting merges get in front of you, uh, making room for someone so that they can comfortably get into traffic and, and become part of the flow of traffic. Uh, it, it's really difficult to know what your drivers are doing out there. The cameras have really uh, helped us to uh, look at our drivers and, and see what needs to be improved. And, and we've begun to make those improvements. But really, that's uh, patience and courtesy are huge on the roadway. I, I just can't say enough about it. When I do ride-alongs with our drivers, I do look for that in our drivers. If they don't exhibit it, I do try to let them know that they need to work on on those two factors. So, uh, Awareness. I mentioned a few slides ago about being aware of what's around you. Uh, it doesn't do you any good if you're surrounded by a pack of vehicles. That is not security. That's insecurity because you're relying on all the other vehicles around you to be the same type of driver that you want to be. And they are not all like that. Some are impatient. Some are not experienced. Some are anxiety ridden. Some are scared to death. And they're all surrounding you. Do you really want those four? criteria surrounding you. Do I want an anxiety, fearful, impatient, uncourteous person around me? The answer for me is no. So the further I could separate myself from those type of people, the better off I'm going to be. So that means looking in your mirrors every five to eight seconds. Be aware of what's around you. Don't let cars sneak up on you and be in your blind area. And then you go to move over and now you're involved in an accident. Uh, if someone's behind you, increase your following distance so you don't have to hit the brakes hard, causing the person behind you to run into the back of you. Granted, it's their fault, but again, your day is now slowed down. You may not make it to your delivery, and there's going to be an accident on your PSP report if it's reportable. And granted, it'll be a non-preventable, but it's still going to be there. Why have that entry if you could have avoided that? C, concentration. We probably all experience the fact that we drive in the wintertime and, or I'm sorry, the summertime, and we have a pretty relaxing day. We enjoy our job. It's a great job. We get to drive around. We see the country and life is good. We come back from a snowy, road, ice roadway covered day and we're exhausted. It's because mentally it takes a lot more concentration to drive in, in uh, inclement weather than it does in relaxing, beautiful weather. So your level of concentration, you need to crank it up a notch or two uh, when you're winter driving and just concentrate more on what you're doing. Think about what you're doing. Don't become complacent and just start daydreaming and, and not paying attention. And then exit. As I would do ride-alongs with drivers, I made it a point Throughout the course of the day, numerous times a day, as many times as I need to, I would always say, for example, Conrad, where would you go if something happened right now? If this vehicle in front of us had a blowout, had a heart attack, uh, got involved in an incident, what would you do? And I would hope, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Conrad, we'll say Bob. I would hope that Bob would have an answer for me because the gentlemen, the people that scared me the most were the people that did not have an answer for me. And that's because they didn't have an answer because they had nowhere to go. They were following too closely. They had cars on both sides of them. There was a vehicle right behind us 
that I could barely see other than looking at a shadow in the mirror. A uh, very uncomfortable place to be. And inevitably, many of them, I would say that, and they wouldn't say a word, and we'd slow down and, and begin to create space. But really, always leaving yourself out is very important, something you should always be asking yourself as you're driving by yourself. You could be in your car, on a motorcycle, uh, anything. Constantly ask yourself, what would I do if, where would I go if this were to happen? And if you don't have an answer, you need to find an answer. All right, so let's quickly review uh, some of the hazards that we had brought up at this point. So let's look at this one and, and see what we're going to call this one, because it can be called a number of them, but let's see what we're going to call this one. We're going to call this one reduced visibility. Pretty apparent. We're having difficulty past, seeing past car number four over there with the headlights. That's about the last one I'm probably going to see at this point. I could see the car in front of me. Um, so reduce visibility, a huge hazard. We want to try to increase our visibility. Second hazard, other than the fact that I wouldn't want to get in a fight with this guy because he doesn't look real happy at the moment, but it's going to be ice and snow on your windows. I'm sure we've all seen, and it's probably going to be happening all season this season, somebody cuts out a little hole about a 12 inches in diameter right in the middle of their windshield and off they go down the road. Can't see anything other than that little 12 inch diameter window out the windshield. And I guess they're just praying that there's nobody on their sides or behind them or anything like that. So this guy may not be the happiest looking guy in the world, but at least he is making an effort to scrape that windshield off, get the ice and snow off of those windows, you know, make sure your windshield wipers work. While we're on that subject, make sure you got the uh, proper windshield washer fluid in your container. If you need to add a little bit of deicer, feel free to do that. Don't just run pure water because when you go to use it, you're going to find out that it's frozen along with many other things. So, And also just a, a quick PPE thing here too, um, getting in and out of the truck or any vehicle or walking on the road on the uh, parking lot behind him could be black ice. So just from, uh, you know, kind of off the driving part, but into the personal protection is just be careful where you're walking in times like this. The black ice, you, next thing you know, you slipped, you've broken a leg, you've torn your rotator cuff, and now you're no longer able to work because of those injuries. So keep that in mind as you're, as you're working yourself through this winter season. Again, there's going to be a eight letter word. It's going to be filled into that blank there, and I'm pretty sure that everyone is writing it down as I speak. So let's give it a split second. Okay, that's enough time. Everybody's got it figured out, I'm sure. Let's see what that word is. And the word is going to be slippery. Slow, sl snow and ice equals slippery roads. Not much more needs to be said on that, as we can experience it every day. Let's move on to the next one, a hazard. So, man, what a beautiful, that is a, oh, my God. Where did that go? Hmm. Rapidly changing conditions. Now, I'm not in Cleveland at this point, but we just had a big storm come through Cleveland, Erie, Pennsylvania, up into Buffalo along the I-90 corridor. Oh, I got a funny feeling this is probably what it looked like along there. So rapidly changing conditions occurs all the time in I-90 up, up in that area. Uh, very hazardous. And there's other places, I'm sure, out in the Upper West, like I mentioned earlier, Dakotas and areas like that. Uh, but conditions change rapidly. You want to keep an eye on that. From looking at this picture, these people look like they've done a pretty good job keeping their following distance. This guy right in the lower left-hand corner, he's a bit close to that car in front of him. But that, that first car that you're looking at there has got a nice following distance from the car in front of him. So he should be okay. And then uh, we talked about this earlier. Boy, that boy, that rotor came to a nice stop pretty quickly, didn't it? Well, that's because there's no snow or ice on the ground. But had there been ice or snow on the ground, that rotor and uh, caliper probably would have slid right off the slide, off into Netherland and, and never to be seen again. So braking performance, remember, you want to keep as much traction on the roadway as you can. Brake gently. You don't have to do any hazard braking. Emergency braking, minimize that, eliminate it if you can. 
other vehicles. I talked about this one also. Uh, you got a snowplow in front of you. Don't pass snowplows. Snowplows in a snowstorm are your best buddy. You should pay them because they're basically clearing the way for you. They're making your life much easier. They might not be going as fast as you would like, but you'll get to where you're going finally. But if you decide to lead the charge and pass the snowplow, you don't have a snowplow in the front of your car, nor do you have the traction that that snowplow truck has got. And next thing you know, you've become an obstacle on the roadway because you're either stuck, you've slid off the road, or you've gotten involved in an accident. And this is where that old, uh, what is that, space? And what was P? Patience and courtesy? Patience and courtesy would come into a, a big play here in this type of scenario. Keep an eye on these vehicles coming towards you. Who's to say that somebody isn't texting, uh, spilled a coffee on their lap? All of a sudden, they jerk their wheel to the left, and now they're coming straight at you. This gets into what would you do if? Where would I go if that pickup truck, for example, veered into my lane if I'm in that car that's right in front of you there, whatever that is, a Ford Flex or can't tell. Um, but what would I do? Just think about it. And that, next thing you know, the pickup truck is by you and you don't have to think about that truck, but now I'm thinking about the next car. So very dangerous situations, but really I think one of the biggest points of this is, is don't pass plow trucks. You're not gonna get ahead of the game. Just be patient, work with them, help make their job a little bit easier and they'll make your job easier. All right, so this kind of, <clears throat> real quickly, last few minutes, I'd like to, here at AIM, one of our added values with customers that we work with is we offer uh, road rescue services, which I think Conrad mentioned in the introduction. But along with that, we, we uh, also offer different bits of information throughout the season to help customers uh, get better use out of their vehicles. Uh, we call it Operation Snowflake. Every year we, we come out with it, and it's pretty much the same stuff, but it's things that some customers may need to know. Um, so starting your equipment, if you experience difficulty starting, please don't crank the engine for more than 15 seconds at a time so as to not burn out the starter. After, after three attempts of no more than 15 seconds, then give Road Rescue a call. That's why you signed on to us. That's what we do, is we, we're there to help you. So make that call if you're having difficulty starting the engine. Don't run the battery dead. And now you have a dead battery and the truck still won't start, but now the battery's dead. So for customers that we have on this call, feel, feel free, free to reach out. And I would think that you've already received some information on this uh, Operation Snowflake that we implement at the beginning of the season already. So uh, number two, engine heater. If you have an engine heater or you're using an engine heater, plug that in after each trip. Uh, you want to do that while the engine's still hot. Make sure that you check your hookups in your yard. You may have yards, who knows when the last time it's been checked. Most likely it's went through the entire spring, summer, and fall, and nobody's even realized we had one. Until the day you plug it in, you come in the next morning and realize the circuit breaker popped or it's GFI'd, and your truck never was charged. Um, so for our customers who do have that, in their yards, I'd recommend going out, make sure all your plugs are working, make sure all the electrical systems are in proper working order uh, and get that all figured out before you really need it. Third item, it's gonna be air tanks. Air tanks, uh, you should be draining them, and draining them at the end of each trip to verify the system is free of water. If that water freezes in your airline system, you're gonna be stuck going nowhere until that gets thawed out. So you want to, you know, if your drivers aren't familiar, some may not be. Uh, it's not a huge thing that, you know, you're supposed to do it, coulda, woulda, shoulda, but guys get away from it over the, over the years, and next thing you know, it never gets pulled. Um, or you get in an old truck, it's never been pulled. You're a responsible driver, you begin to drain your air tanks, and next thing you know, you have a slight air leak coming out of that valve because it's never been used. Um, so... Get those air tank valves going, maybe lubricate them up a little bit, make sure working properly, and make sure you drain them at the end of each day so that you're not stuck with brakes being stuck on because of the water in the line. And number four, Ames Fuel. And I don't know at what point we do this. It may be early November, but we do run 
a blended fuel when the season begins. So if you fuel at any aim location, you could be confident in the fact that our fuel is blended and is prepared for cold weather. Uh, you won't have any gel ups or frozen fuel because of lack of additives. So just something to keep in mind. One thing, if you if you are a customer that, or if you are not one of our customers, uh, keep in mind that you know some outside people that sell gas aren't really that concerned about what type of additive is in it. You could purchase fuel in northern Florida. Next thing you know, you're in Montana, stuck it's minus 10 degrees, and now your fuel is gelled up. So just keep that in mind. And the last item we have going on are the warning lights. So anytime you see uh, any lights on the on your dashboard when you start the truck or while the truck's running, a uh, malfunctioning indicator lamp, a check engine light, anything of that nature, give Road Rescue a call right away. They'll guide you as to the proper procedure. Can you continue to drive? Should you look to bring it into a shop or get it repaired? Uh, but don't just keep running with warning lights because it's usually not a good sign. And don't be surprised. You'll be running down the road and all of a sudden your next call is the truck does not want to run anymore. I've been derated. That's been a common. We have some deaf issues throughout the industry. Uh, deaf issues are still popping up a little bit here and there. So uh, if you let your drivers know that if you see these warning lights on and you are an AIM customer, please feel free to call into Road Rescue and get advice as to what to do. So with that, I'm going to close it out. I'd like to thank everyone on this call for being here. I really appreciate it. I know it's late in the afternoon for some of you. I hope I've given you a couple little tidbits of information that you could take back to your drivers and maybe even use personally. I want to thank Conrad and Jessica for allowing me to put these webinars on every uh, every month or so. And uh, also like to thank AIM Transportation Solutions just in general for um, you know doing what we do best is trying to help customers and trying to keep the transportation industry safe. So I'll turn it back over to you, Conrad. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so, so if anyone has any questions, um, I believe you can type your questions or you can click the raise hand button and I can unmute you if you prefer that route. But um, yeah, if anyone has any questions for John, go ahead and ask. Mm, not seeing anything. I guess you're, I guess you're pretty darn thorough, John. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, yep, I'm glad. I'm, yeah. uh, I'm glad. Yeah, well, you you know, and of course, la later on, if any of you end up having questions for John about today's topic or really any other safety related concerns, um, feel free to shoot him an email. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about AIM services, please reach out to us. Um, other than that, that's that's all we that's all we have today. So just again, thank you for your time and thank you, John, for lending us your expertise. It's always a pleasure. All right. Thank you, Conrad. Have a nice yep. day, everyone. Thanks. Bye.